not to put on any evidence at either the guilt and innocence phase or phase or the, the punishment phase, which, as you know, in a death penalty case, that's the most important part of the trial. And one of the reasons they didn't put it on is because they didn't think that the state of Texas had enough evidence to charge him with capital murder. So they, their strategy really was suicide. Um, I mean, it didn't matter what they thought. Uh, the fact that the jury didn't hear jury didn't hear anything about good things about Walter and only bad things made them think that there weren't any good things. And he had a whole classroom of people who would have testified on his behalf. Uh, he didn't have a prior record. Ooh, someone's cell phone. Oh. He didn't have a prior record. Um, he did confess. Um, three times, all confessions were voluntary, and um, and the jury just really wanted to hear something good, but he didn't have that opportunity. And um, so I agreed to help on the case, um, but then on the last day of his life, I went, flew from Connecticut to Texas, and uh, went to see him on death row and said, you know, do you want me to file another appeal? Should we go back? renew, amend the application for clemency. I mean, at this point, I didn't know what to do. What do you want me to do? And he said, no, no, I really, John, I don't, that's fine, it, it's over. He said, but there is one thing I want to ask you, but I don't know how to. And I said, Walter, ask me anything. And he said, I don't want to die alone tonight. Will you be there for me? And what kind, I mean, that's the most incredible question anybody can get. I wasn't prepared for it, and I said, absolutely. Now, I wasn't on the witness list, so I had to fight the state of Texas for 10 hours, the next 10 hours, to get on the witness list. And I had to put up with, you know, a warden saying, Ms. Cheever, do you have a husband or a father? I said, yes, sir, I have one beach. Well, they must have beans for brains, because I never let my little girl see what you're going to see tonight. I said, well, you know, thank you, but let's worry about Walter, not me. But when I stood across and, and said my goodbyes and, and watched the execution, I always... I never pictured that whole scene. I had always pictured Walter walking off death row and into the general prison population. And because he had turned down a plea bargain of nine years, I always knew that he would one day be paroled. And so when I watched his execution, I thought, you know, the answer to that question died with him. But then I went back to my quaint little Connecticut town with the white picket fence and the nine and a half month old son and the two and a half year old daughter and the very patient husband, and went back to work as uh, managing editor of the National Law Journal. And but I was I was a totally changed person. And I thought I, I really I was in a state of shock because I really always pictured Walter walking off. And then when he died that night, I thought you know I'll never know the answer to this question. And then after many sleepless not only nights, months, years, two years later, I I realized that there was a group of people that could answer that question, and they were the class of 72, the group of individuals who were on death row in 1972 when the death penalty was abolished, and no one had really done any study on them. I mean, it, this was of 587 men and two women. This was really, um, until now, the, the largest unexamined social experiment in criminal justice history, and there had been, there was one great study that followed them up into the 80s, but then not that many were let out. And so by the time I started my research in 1997 um, through 2005, so it's 33 years of, of prison and parole data, I found out that of the 589 people on death row, 322 have been released. And, um, and so I decided that I was gonna find those 322 and find out what they did with their second chance. And that's why uh, Pops is here, not only because he's one of the survivors, he has an incredible story, and he's also an, an inspiration and uh, a man with, who was put on death row from 1958 to actually 1973, because even though the death penalty was abolished on June 29, 1972, it took several states another year to move those inmates off death row. And you can imagine what the summer of, of 72 was like. I mean, the legislators were freaking out. They all ran back to their state houses and tried to put together a new death penalty law that would pass constitutional muster 
and they they tried it and and actually but actually for the, four, the next four years it was a moratorium and in 1973 pops was moved from Louisiana's death row into the general prison population um, and he I mean he served uh, 14 years on death row and 38 years inside and the reason why some people got out and some didn't if the laws in the states, I mean, we're talking about 31 states across the United States, and the laws were different. In some states, life meant your natural life, and the only way that you would leave prison was in a pine box. In other states, like Texas, it, it was 10 or 20 years. And so that's why there's a variation of who got out and who didn't. But of those 322, after, it took two years to find out who was on death row, because these, this is the day before um, the computers and everything, you know, stuff was in a ledger book, and it was really who was physically on death row. I mean, if you're waiting transport, they, they might not count you as being on death row. So what I did was I went through, did, you know, LexisNexis searches, uh, talked to some of the inmates that I did find, talked to lawyers, looked in the legal books for, you know, talk to prison and parole officials, judges, you know, I've got a lot of uh, evidence on paper and then also anecdotal evidence. Once I talked to one inmate, he would say, oh, have you talked to my buddy Joe? And then, you know, I'd say, oh, act like, you know, that's how you get information. Joe, oh yeah, Joe, now what's his last name? You know, he'd tell me. And, but the, what I did was I wanted to respect their privacy. And so while I did, I found, I found them and then I wrote, three letters. And even though I did have their home telephone addresses um, from a, you know, at that time, it was before a USA search, want to find your lost high school love, you know, this was before that time. Um, I was uh, traded, uh, helped a private detective friend of mine. He would help me find these guys and I would, you know, put pull court filings and, and do other work for them because it was, this database was very expensive. It was about $1.50 a minute. So you had to get on and get off pretty fast. So um, I set up a toll-free number, a P.O. box, um, and sent out the letters. Uh, many came back, wrong address, can't forward, uh, but I ended up finding them. And, and then all of a sudden, and I guess what, you know, when people say what's the most surprising, uh, probably the most surprising was response that um, I was able to interview 125 of the 250 who were still alive and um, they had nothing to gain by talking to me but they wanted they felt the responsibility um, they wanted to put the face of the death penalty death penalty in America and they and so they shared their stories and most all of them except for a few asked for anonymity everybody wanted to put their their face and their name to it because they wanted to get rid of it. I mean, that's how much they wanted, um, they felt the responsibility. And and also they had done very well. And of the 322 that I did, I mean, I followed all 589, but the, of the 322 I focused on, I focused on those who were, who were, um, had been released because they are the ones that really test the theory, do convicted killers kill again? And, um, and I and I didn't want to I didn't want to interview the ones that were inside I didn't want to develop pen pal relationships because they weren't tested and um, that's not to say I ignored them but um, but I wanted to really find out about the ones who had been tested on a daily basis what was their reentry like uh, and and the most important thing I think was what made some succeed and others fail and so the the four themes that I found through the success stories were uh, faith, family, education, and the passage of time. And when I say faith, yes, a lot was the Christian faith because on most death rows in the United States at that time, there was only one book that was allowed. Everything else was considered contraband except the Bible. And so if you're in a six by eight cell and you know there's not a whole lot to do, um, and there's one book, you read it. And, it's, and if you didn't know how to read, your fellow inmates, the guy next to you, teach you how to read, or even some of the prison guards. So they they got back to their faith or really read that Bible over and over again. 
Um, but the second kind of faith, that, that wasn't for everybody, but it was a majority. The second kind of faith was a faith in themselves, that they never ever pictured themselves sitting in the electric chair. And it was that inner faith, that, that uh, strength that they pulled on to get them through the horrors of death row all that time. So it was a, it was a, you know, a Christian faith, a religious faith, and it was also a faith in themselves. The second thing was family. It wasn't always just the family that they came from, although Mr. Bickham was very lucky because he had an incredible family and who visited him every time they could. Siblings, mother, you know, um, and, and his wife. Um, so they had that family that they, they came from that was a great support. But for those who had, were estranged from their family, they created a family of fellow death row inmates. And in one chapter, and the state's not named because they asked for anonymity uh, and the person, but in one, in one of the chapters in the book, it talks about the, the death row five. And they made a pact that if they ever got out, they would always be there for each other. They were, they were a band of, of brothers. And so they have all stayed clean. They have not had one problem with law enforcement because not to say their lives have been easy, but every time something, if there's a, a death in the family, a divorce, uh, they feel like maybe one of their brothers is get messing around with the wrong crowd, all it takes is a phone call and they're all there. The other four are all there for, for that one, one individual. And so that's an incredible story of, of family. They also credit uh, prison wardens and guards and chaplains that have kept up with them and encouraged them um, to do well on the outside and kind of protected them on the inside. Uh, the third thing, and it's not in any order of importance, one of the most important things actually was education or job skills. Because they had that faith that they would get um, out, uh, and they knew they would get out, not for any reason except they just had that feeling that they spent their time in prison either going back to school and getting their GEDs or, um, you know, as Reverend Bickham, getting uh, ordained as a Methodist minister, uh, getting college degrees, a few have master's degrees. And for the other ones that didn't want to take that, uh, you know, standard education route, they, they did job, they learned job skills, something that they could, when they got out, they could earn a living like um, carpentry or electrician or something else. And then the fourth thing is passage of time. You know, the person you are at 19 is not the person you are at 49 or 59. And in many of these instances, it was a murder that was fueled by drugs or alcohol, or it was a rash decision. I mean, very few of the ones that were on death row was it a really planned, premeditated murder. And so when you're 19 or 20, you make those kind of decisions. And when I talk to university students and, and high school students, you know, I talk about the law of parties. And, um, you know, that, and, and I think a lot of kids don't know this, but, you know, if you're, if five of you are in the station wagon on a Saturday night and decide, you know, to send the oldest looking one in to go buy a case of beer, and he or she, but he is high on, on something and, and maybe packing a pistol and decides he doesn't want to pay and ends up shooting uh, the convenience store clerk, everybody sitting in that car is responsible and eligible and can be indicted and is indicted for capital murder. Even though you may have given your five bucks for that case of beer, it doesn't matter. The law of parties is so strong that you, you knew or should have known that, that your buddy was going to go in there and commit a murder. So, uh, you know, the initial reaction when people don't know, they were like, well, that's not fair. I said, oh, that's just the beginning of the death penalty. Um, and so, so that's, I mean, so that's one of the issues that is really important. There are people on death row that never pull the trigger. And in fact, in one of the, the chapters of the book, Chuck Colhane, uh, four out of the five individuals on New York State's death row never pull the trigger, uh, but they were still sent to death row. 
Um, and so, of this group of 322, what was most fascinating is to find out how they did on the outside. And the, the good news is they did well. And when I say well, they stayed out of trouble for the most part. 111 did go back in, and that's a third, but it's still half of what the recidivism rate is for the general prison population in this country. And of those 111, 75 went in for technical parole violations, which I think I said today was some could be not me making your appointment with your parole officer, or not paying a court fine, or hanging around with convicted felons. You know, well, those are the guys you, you know, hung out with in prison, and so you hang out on the outside. But you know, you can't you can't hang out with people that have a record. Um, being in a bar, even if you weren't drinking, just being in a bar. Uh, one individual in New Hampshire was, uh, his parole was revoked because he was having a, a, an affair with a married woman. Um, so, I mean, it goes from the extremes, uh, and it really depends on the parole officer, it has an incredible amount of power. Um, and then, the, of those 111, the 75 went back for technical parole violations, 32 went back for more aggravated circumstances, aggravated robbery, burglary, attempted murder. And then of the 322, five did kill again. Um, and, you know, while every murder is absolutely horrible, what's so fascinating about that small number, five out of 322, is that these were people, we thought that it was going to be 322 out of 322 committed murder, because we as a society said we had to kill these men because they would kill again, and that's not what happened. And the, the poster boy, as you all know, is, you know, committed a horrible crime here in, in Austin. But he, Kenneth Allen McDuff, I mean, he was a serial killer in the 60s, and he was a serial killer in the 90s. And in fact, every time he was psychologically evaluated in prison, they said he's a psychopath, he's a sociopath, he does, he's a thrill for the kill. He just doesn't feel anything. He just kind of like gets off by killing. And he was up for parole 17 times. And then the state of Texas was faced with a, a federal overcrowding lawsuit, the Ruiz case. And so the parole board decided to give him parole and release him. Now what I find amazing is that, you know, if I was, had all those inmates to parole, I, I think I'd parole a burglar before I'd parole a serial killer. So I'm not quite sure there's allegations of bribes uh, from the McDuff family to parole board members, and um, two days after he was released from prison, uh, the body of a woman surfaced, uh, a prostitute. Actually, he enrolled in a college and lived in a dorm at age 33, um, and, and then the first body, and then the second body a couple days later. And the Texas Rangers knew exactly who it was. They knew it was McDuff. And so he was executed in uh, 1998, by that time, they had linked him to, to seven um, murders. The other four of the five that killed um, were, you, were, I would say for the most part, yeah, actually four of the five were fueled by uh, drugs and alcohol or was part of a, a drug deal gone bad um, or a smoke, one with a situation with smoke and crack at a party and things got out of control. Uh, but, of the, but look at the numbers, look at all the, the, other, the other men that's, that stayed out and did, did well. And when I say they did well, you know, it's not a well that they, you know, made a lot of money and were elected mayor, but they did well because they gave back to society, because they knew they could never repay the debt, that they, the life that they took. And they, they joined their church, they joined the church family. And when a parole officer, not their parole officer, but anyone, or law enforcement, they call him up and say, you know, will you talk to, to Johnny, because he's going down, you know, this 19-year-old kid, he's going down the path that, that you went down, you know, 40 years ago. And so that's the way they get back. And when I interviewed them, everybody that I interviewed, um, either by the phone or in person, was openly remorseful and cried openly about the crime that, that landed them on death row 30 or 40 years ago. So, you know, rehabilitation is possible. I mean, the person you are at 19 is not the same person you are. And so that's, that's the good news, 
the great news out of, um, out of this book and out of this study, out of the 33 years of uh, prison and parole data that I accumulated. Um, but it, you know, and, and but it, what I did also, because it was, you know, and this book took many different lives and forms and everything else, I first wrote it, you know, just as a, you know, journalist, because that's my train, I've been doing this for a long time, and, um, you know, just give me the facts, ma'am, kind of stuff. And then a couple of friends looked at it and said, Joan, you know, we're interested in what happened to this group, but what, you know, I think you need to put in there is, why in the hell did you leave these, now, two children, uh, why did you leave these two kids on the soccer field, you know, get on a plane and go hang out for a weekend or a week with convicted killers? I mean, you really need to say, tell about why you did that. And really, the thing that, that I couldn't sleep at night was I had to find the answer to that question, and that's really prompted me um, to go continue to search and to go find as many people as I could, because I knew that the more I found, the more stories, the more individuals I found, the more stories and the more data. And so, you know, when pro-death penalty people talk about, you know, the death penalty and it's a deterrent or, you know, everything else, I say, you know what, read the book, look at the stats. I don't have to make the case for abolition because the class of 72 does it for me. They do it for all of us. And um, they're the ones that were on death row that happened to be at the right place at the right time for an incredible moment in history, June 29th, 1972. Um, this year is going to be the 35th anniversary of the Furman decision. And um, I think we're moving closer to abolition than we ever have before, except for some reason I just don't understand the state of Texas, and I was born here. But you know, there's, there's stays of execution all over the United States based on the, the lethal injection cocktail. And uh, Texas just says the law doesn't apply to us and they just go ahead. I mean, a back-to-back -back, uh, execution last week. And, you know, it's just amazing uh, that you can stop executions in most of the United States, but in Texas you can't. So I give you all a lot of credit for being here. There's quite the challenge in this state. Uh, but I also think, when I talk, you know, at the Rotary Club, uh, you know, a bunch of businessmen, and they say, well, you know, it's, why should we house them for the rest of their life instead of execute them? I said, well, you know, there's many, many reasons. I mean, the 123 innocent on death row, that's 123 reasons, but I don't get into it with them. I go, well, you're, you know, what, what are you doing throwing away your money? They said, what do you mean? I said, well, it costs six hundred fifty to $800,000 to keep a person in prison for life versus $2.3 million up to $25 million in New Jersey when they figured out the, you know, the calculations to execute someone. Uh, well, then, you know, you've got a room full of businessmen. I said, I don't know. You know, I didn't, the reason I went into journalism is because I had math anxiety. I said, but you all do the calculations. I mean, I think you get totally ripped off as a taxpayer. And as Christina says, you know, you can use that money at the beginning of a, a child's life instead of at the end of a life. And, uh, well, they've never, they've never heard that before. And they were, and I said, don't, you know, go look, look for yourself and figure it out. Well, you know, and then one man said, why does it take so long? Why don't you just, you know, put them, put them on trial get the death penalty, execute them. I said, oh, well, you know, there's something called uh, the appeals process. And that, you know, another court checks this, you know, the trial court's homework. And then, you know, we also have something called the U.S. Constitution. Although in this administration, <laughs> I don't even know if they've even read it. But, um, but uh, you know, there's a checks and balances that if you are going to go for the ultimate punishment, with this, which is death, and because the Supreme Court has said death is different, then you better make sure uh, that you go through the, the appellate process and, and the full appellate process. It's just not the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the state's highest court, uh, the Supreme Court in this state, but it's a federal district judge, the federal appellate judge, uh, federal appellate court, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. And it takes a lot of time. Um, and, and thank God it, it, it takes time, because 123 people needed that time uh, to be able to prove their innocence. 
And, you know, thank God that, that Pop's case was held up in the Supreme Court for seven stays of execution. I mean, here's a man that came within 15 hours of an execution. But what's so unbelievable and inspirational about his story is he never saw himself in the electric chair. He, he had a visit from his grandmother three days after he was on death row. And she said, yeah, he's, you're on your way to California. That's where you're going to end up. I mean, from Louisiana, death row. And three days after he arrives there, his grandmother, who had died, appeared in a dream and said, that's where you're going, son. You're going to California. And where did he end up going and living? California. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm going to stop now and take some questions. And, and Pops, if you would like to talk, I want you to talk. Because you know his, his story is, um, this is the oldest survivor of death Row USA right here, and you all are sitting with an incredible piece of history who's gone through unbelievable, uh, an unbelievable situation. Uh, not only survived, but, but came out with such uh, a positive, no bitterness, a positive feeling, a smile on his face, an inspiration, a teacher, um, you know, he, he doesn't look back. He looks ahead, and he's never looked back. And um, and I don't I don't know if really any of us in this room could have survived that and uh, and come out with such a a positive, uh, in wonderful outlook and a, a really incredible, generous spirit uh, to be able. I mean, he got on a train from Oregon and got down to California and then got on a plane to Texas so he could be with you all and talk to you all about his experiences. So um, he's a man.